Good morning, everyone, <clears throat> and welcome to the second annual uh, DMPs of Color Hybrid Conference, uh, Changing the Game, right? That's what we're here to do, and this is what we're here to witness. You all will be have the wonderful opportunity and experience to see individuals who are in practice and changing the game. I have the great pleasure uh, of introducing Dr. Janet Williams, um, and she's going to be coming to you to do our first plenary session. Um, Dr. Janet Williams has been a wit uh, midwife for 19 years, caring for women from puberty to menopause, and has delivered more than 900 babies. She is the founder of Transitions Women's Health Consulting, LLC. She interacts and educates maternal health care professionals and students about implicit bias and racism to help correct this deficiency within our health care system. This is what led to the creation of her signature program entitled Black, B-L-A-C-K, Mothers Interrupted, providing implicit bias education, which is now a mandatory course in most organizations for students and employees. It is with great pleasure, Dr. Williams. Good morning, good morning. So today's topic is recognizing implicit bias, the new trajectory in maternal health. Today, the objectives are you will be able to identify what bias is, and you will be able to identify how bias impacts um, our connection with our clients. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Janet Williams, a midwife of 19 years, also the founder and CEO of Transitions Women's Health Consulting. My mission is to decrease maternal mortality. I am an author, a speaker, a course creator. I'm also a wife, mother, and grandmother, and I'm a rebel. I've been, <laughs> I've been the midwife that always has to speak up at board report, that always has to tell someone they're out of line, that's me. I am also the go-to expert on implicit bias training. It's my absolute pleasure and privilege to stand before you today and um, discuss the myriad of reasons that um, we need to go over to dismantle maternal mortality and the morbidity rates here in the United States. Today, I'm going to share my story from several points. First is a teenage mom who was shuffled through an unyielding system of care. Um, I was denied my rights. I was unheard, unseen, and unsupported. Then as a daughter who witnessed the extraordinary care that my dad received when he was in the, um, the hospital by a staff that I unfairly judged. And finally, as a daughter with a keen perspective on the rights of people um, to self-actualization. So let me tell you a little bit about my journey. This is what I personally experienced, and I'm unmovable on the topic of bias because on my journey, I began to understand the importance and the consequences, not as a nurse, not as a midwife, but as a teen mom. Um, I will never forget the first time I entered this system called healthcare. Um, it was like a maze. I was an 18-year-old mom who was shuffled through an unorganized and unfriendly system. I felt tolerated. No one asked me what I wanted. No one asked me my goals or my wishes. And that went from my first prenatal visit up until the time I walked out the hospital with my son in my arms. Assumptions were made without any input from me. And upon discharge, I was informed that I had received an injection, a medication called Della Damone, which, had t which was designed to dry up my breast milk. What? Breastfeeding had never, ever even been discussed, all the way through prenatal care, all the way until I delivered my son. Did I hear anything after that? No. <laughs> okay. Um, I didn't hear any of the discharge instructions. My mind went blank when the nurse told me that. I was discharged home totally unprepared. I could have had every sign of preeclampsia and not known it at all, because when the when the nurse dropped the mic at to dry up your breast milk, I heard nothing else after that. Remember, about 53% of women die after they go home, after they have their babies. If I could revisit my chart from that admission, I am sure that every box was checked off. 
I wonder what the assumptions were. Did they assume that I didn't care? Did they assume I was a single, unmarried teen mom? No one knew that my goal was to become a nurse, and I had, been ex I had already been accepted in a four-year university. Did anyone even realize I had a supportive family and husband? Did they even care? They simply put me into a box labeled teen mom, and I had not yet found my voice. Three years later, my dad suffered a massive cerebral hemorrhage, and he arrived at the hospital by um, ambulance in a coma. He had collapsed in public, so I, my mom was an educator. She was at work, and the rest of the family was at work. So it was about 12 hours before we realized that he was in the hospital. The staff cared for this stranger for 12 hours without knowing who he was or what his family composition was. I must be very transparent here. When I heard where the hospital was, I became concerned because when I walked into that ICU, I realized that I didn't see anybody that looked like us. No patients and no staff. The other patients had their loved ones at bedside. My father was alone all of that time. None of the staff looked like me either. My first reaction was that he would be treated differently because he would have been placed in a box that no one cared and they didn't know anything um, of him. I am so happy to report that when we walked in, my father had been taken care of in an exemplary manner. He was in a bed, he had tubes from everywhere, and there was not a drop of blood on the bed. He was clean, he was taken care of, you could tell. He died three days later, and they took not only care of my dad, they took care of the whole family. And that, that staff will always be part of the, my family's fabric because we fell in love with them in three days. And we knew that he was dying, but they just, just uh, took care of us, asked us what we needed, and surrounded us with care. Um, I was starting nursing school a few weeks later, and I vowed at that point that I would always take care of families that I cared for and make sure that I knew who they were. But one thing that I learned from that experience is that I was biased. When I walked in that ICU, I really thought that they wouldn't take care of him. And they had done nothing negative. It was just my thinking. Just an automatic thought. At age 92, my mom, who was hospitalized with CHF, after several days of uh, painful tests and procedures, she decided she wanted to go home. My mom was 93, but she was sharp. And she knew what she wanted the rest of her days to look like. The visiting hours left her alone most of the day because my brother and I were working. And so she was just in the hospital having tests. And so um, she said, I want to go home. So I approached the doctor that was a hospitalist to let him know that she wanted to go home. He made me sign her out AMA. <laughs> the hospitalist said he didn't want to discharge his unstable patient, 93, okay? I asked him a very important question that day. I said, can you cure her or add one day to her life? And he had to tell me no, he couldn't. I told him about palliative care and medical science couldn't compete with emotional and spiritual peace. And he said he understood that, but he still made me sign her out AMA. But I did, I signed her out, and I realized that all my experiences had led up to that day. I signed her out and she died at home a month later, surrounded by family and friends, just as she wished. I was able to midwife my mother through the end of her life and I was able to advocate for her. I had finally found my voice and I was able to advocate for the one that gave me life. Can, by a raise of hands, how many triangles are there that, on this slide? Can somebody, you could just yell out how many triangles you see. You see, you see eight, who saw eight? You saw eight? Okay, how many saw two? Nobody? Six? Six, anybody? Nobody. Zero? Nobody saw no triangles. Okay, good. All right. Okay, so just to let you know, when we deal with computers, they can calculate and, and process 500 operations per second almost. Our brains don't work that fast, okay? 
When you look at this slide, there are actually no triangles on this slide. It's zero. It really was zero. Did your mind tell you that there were triangles there? Okay. It filled in the blanks because when we, when we have something in front of us, we're going to make sense of it. Our brain wants to make sense of things around us. So when we looked at that, we saw circles, right? How many saw circles? There are no circles either. <laughs> 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 yeah, no circles either. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about bias now. Now that you see how this works, okay? So um, perception bias occurs when our brains take a shortcut like they just did. <laughs> and it recognizes certain patterns. It causes us to make assumptions about people's character, their ability, and their intelligence just from a glance. The type of bias looks at the person's social identity, their ethnicity, their sexual orientation, their disabilities, it can be weight, it can be gender. The immediate decision um, now has a direct impact on the way you see people and the way that you view the world. This includes those in our professional and personal lives. Since it's unconscious, most of us don't even realize that we're biased until it's pointed out to us. My one birth and two deaths made me know that I was biased. It removed my blinders, and it made me find my voice. I felt the need to share this information today with you so that you can find yours also. This opportunity affords each of us the chance to plot a different trajectory from this day forward when ha how health care is going to be delivered. Bias exists because of the way we were socialized and because images we were exposed to over our lifetime. It's a protective mechanism sometimes where it allows us to make split decisions, but they're not always right. It, it allows us to get ready to fight or flight. If you saw something that scared you, it would give you the, the mindset to get away from that, that um, danger. How you view your surroundings depends on where you lived, who you grew up around, what stories were you told, what do you watch on TV. Our initial perception is often our reality, but wait, all stories are important. Just review your patient's social determinants of health, and you would understand what's happening in the background of their life. Let me correct that statement. To us on a normal routine day at work, it's in the background, but it's their life. Okay, and they are 100% present in it. Okay, there are different types of bias. Um, I want you to close your eyes and imagine, just everybody close your eyes for one minute. Imagine you're on, you're, it's dusk in the evening, it's starting to get dark. You're going to go up the steps of an elevated train platform. You're walking up the steps. When you get to the platform, you're going to walk to the far end of the platform. You get to the far end, and you realize that there is only one means of egress. That's the exit, how to get off that platform. It's the way you just walked up the steps. Out the corner of your eye, you see a large man coming up the steps. Your heart begins to pound. Okay, let's use that same scenario. You walked up the same steps. You're, you walk to the far end of the platform. And there you see a little old lady coming up the steps. How does that make you feel? Okay, can any, you could open your eyes. Can anybody tell me how they felt when that man came up the steps? Okay, anybody else? The first part, um, I think you feel like your senses are up, like you're more aware, um, mm -hmm. so you pay a little more attention. Mm -hmm. The other one, you can get lost, you know, at day to day, you're on your phone doing business, things like that, you may not pay as much attention so your heart is low on that side. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. Definitely body. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Was that bias? Did he do anything to you? Did he say anything to you? Did he even look at you? Okay. Okay. <laughs> Just to let you know, that scenario is something that I kind of do a lot, and my friends are like, why do you do that? When I walk down the street, I always try to speak to especially young black men. I try to go out of my way to speak to them because that's the feeling that people get when they're just walking down the street. Like, they haven't done anything, but people look at them as a threat. And I have a son, and I want to make sure, I, I pray that wherever he is, somebody does that for him. And I pray that we all get in a habit of doing that, you know, speaking to our young men and, and, and affirming them and letting us know, letting them know that we see them and that we don't see them as a threat. Okay. Okay. Let me just flip my thing because, okay. Okay, so there are many different types of bias, okay? We're gonna just talk about a few of them today. Um, we all make assumptions. There's a study that was done on um, women going to the ER with right lower quadrant pain. And it demonstrated that Caucasian women were first evaluated for what you think? What do you think white women were evaluated for? Black women? Anybody? PID, pelvic inflammatory disease, assuming that they have an STD that has traveled to the uterus or the female organs. Okay. Um, what was the assumption there that black women were more promiscuous? that we, um, you know, that's again an assumption, okay? Women of color also had drug screens more often, just walking in the door of an ER, okay? There, there are certain uh, rules at different hospitals or policies that, that have this in place. If they haven't been to so many appointments for their prenatal care, if they come in in preterm labor, they were a long list. It's, it's changing now, but at the beginning, when I was a midwife, that was, they were rules. If they didn't have five or more visits, they get a drug screen, okay? If they told you they smoked marijuana at 16, they got a drug screen. You know, it, it, it's built into policies. So we have to really look very hard at, at bias and how it's, you know, per, uh, per, perpetrated by our organization also. Structural, Structural. Mm -hmm. it's built in, okay? Um, there's a lot of bias that's um, it's unconscious. Like you see how you did it and you weren't really thinking about it, it just came to your mind. But once we learn about uh, bias, then at that point we have to be aware of it and try to do something about it. Okay. 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 So conformity bi bias. This is when one feels pressure to act um, because of the people around us. It can be colleagues, friends, or family. What we need to feel accepted, and we try to please those in our circle around us. At the time, we're really not thinking independently. We're being led. It's known as groupthink. It occurs when the group begin to take similar views and often leads to very poor decisions. To overcome this type of bias, the organization must create an environment where staff members feel comfortable speaking up, and where other staff members are encouraged to listen and to discuss things without feeling pressured or ostracized. I know from experience that a conversation needs to be started and continued and repeated when we start talking about bias. It's not something you talk about once and it goes away or that you have it down pat. You have to practice, okay? We need to get over the, uh, word, the emotionalism that the word bias brings up. People shut down. You say bias, racism, they shut down, okay? But we need, they need to get over that emotionalism um, that it brings to the surface and begin to do the actual work. The self-assessment is necessary to expand our limited perceptions and viewpoints of those we meet and judge daily. Many of us know one story about a group of people, but it's, un it's important that we understand the many stories and to be open to hearing them. It will expand our minds as we begin to learn not only history, but her story and their story, not only the one story that you know or have heard or have even experienced. 
but the rich variety of stories that remove blinders and allow each of us to um, view others through a prism of possibilities instead of through tunnel vision. Start with a self-audit. We need to look inward to check our perception barometer. Most of us in the past have been, I'm sure, in implicit bias training, but how many of us made a conscious effort to practice the steps necessary to change our minds? Did we even know how to begin to do that? But we can learn a shortcut to short circuit those initial reactions. Okay. So let's talk about maternal mortality. Maternal mortality is defined as the number of maternal deaths per 100,000 live births. In the US, we have the highest maternal mortality rate than any other industrialized nation. In September of this year, 2020, the CDC just released the following findings. They found that 80% or more of pregnancy-related deaths in the United States were preventable. The causes of death include mental health. It was a, a large um, segment of women died from mental health reasons, suicide, okay? Um, substance abuse, overdoses, hemorrhage, embolus, cardiac conditions like cardiomyopathies, infection, and hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, such as HELP syndrome, preeclampsia, eclampsia. Okay. The underlying cause of death were found to be different by race and ethnicity in the non-Hispanic blacks. Uh, heart disease and coronary disorders were the leading causes, whereas in Hispanics and non-Hispanic white, the leading cause of death was mental disorders. 22 of the deaths um, happened before, during pregnancy, and then 25 on the day of delivery or in the hospitalization period, and 53% of those deaths occur from seven days after delivery up into a, a year. It takes a village to prevent needless fatalities. Why do I say that? Again, up to 53% of pregnancy-related deaths occur after uh, within the year after delivery. So it's essential that all healthcare professionals that see clients um, inquire whether that patient is currently pregnant or has been pregnant in the last year. And that's important for all of us, even those that are not in the maternal child realm. If we have any pediatric nurse practitioners, anybody that's seeing women, we need to ask that question because that's a big part of their history and, and their um, diagnosis and treatments. Um, so, those of us who work in healthcare facilities, private practices, in the communities, and our family members, we need to be teaching our family members that they recognize the, the things that need to be um, documented and, and followed up on. We need to listen to the concerns of people who are pregnant and have been pregnant in the last year and help them get the help that they need. So there's a plethora of isms that contribute to maternal mortality. Implicit bias, okay, racism are contributing to the public health crisis. We talked about microaggressions a few minutes ago. You heard Danielle mention microaggressions. It's real, it's real. Daily stress, inequity in healthcare and in life in general, those negative stereotypes. This is what black women deal with every day. So black women, we were talking about the um, differences in ethnicity, okay? And black women are three to four times more likely to die than white women. That's a, a national average. When you come to New York, it can be one, it could be eight times more likely to die, okay? And these are statistics that you don't hear often. Yeah, eight times, eight times. Okay. Uh, one reason is that we start off pregnancy usually in a more unhealthy state for uh, many reasons. Now that we delved into bias, okay, let's talk about some other data here. I'm sorry, I'm just trying to find my statistics here. Here they are. Okay. So um, the statistics, especially since COVID, 
um, started with sobering. The CDC reported that maternal mortality rates have increased 14% between 2019 and 2020. And um, they realized that the statistics for a woman of color now in the U.S. in 2020 was 55.3 per 100,000. Okay, the other, the other national statistic was in the 30s. We're up in the 50s for black women. Okay, so this slide, this slide here, these women are actual women that died um, from maternal mortality. This was back in, two, those women died in 2017. Approximately seven to 800 women a year die in the U.S. from maternal mortality. Maternal morbidity, on the other hand, is the illnesses or the things that can happen when a woman is pregnant. It's a severe a disorder. It can be preeclampsia. It can be hemorrhage. But it, um, wait, let me just, I keep passing my things. Wait a minute. One second. I just need to go back once. Okay. Th these statistics change since I've made these slides, Okay. So right now, in 2018, it was 37 per 100, and now it's up to 50, 55.3 per 100, all right? And a few weeks ago, that new report just came out saying now 80% are, are um, preventable. A few weeks ago before that, it was 60%. So we're seeing a big change in what's happening here, okay? I realize that it's necessary to track data to understand trends, but if I can impress one important fact on you today is that each data point represent a woman, represents a woman who died, whose baby was sent home without a mom, and whose family is forever devastated, a life many of us might have touched. We must learn to change these outcomes one life at a time, one encounter at a time, and we can no longer afford to hear these statistics and continue to do business as usual. Um, like I said, 80% of these deaths were preventable. So what's a preventable death? It's a death that under reasonable circumstances could have been prevented by a person, one provider, a team, or an organization. Why is preventing poor maternal outcomes, um, it has to be dealt with on several levels. It can't be just one of us. It has to go up several levels. It has to get out in the, to, to the community. Learning, one thing that we can do to help prevent this is to learn more about implicit bias. And hearing this information and seeing the faces of women should ignite a flame in each of us. So I want to tell you a few, these aren't stories. These are people that actually died that I'm familiar with. And I call this Say My Name. These are not statistics. To help clarify uh, maternal mortality, let me introduce the stories of several families. I share this information within the context that each realized that there was a problem, reported it to providers, and each attempted to advocate for themselves to no avail. Each had partners who also spoke up and tried to advocate for their loved ones. Each missed their futures and a chance to raise their children. Why? Because they were unheard, unseen, and unsupported. Due to bias, due to racism. The first person I'd like to tell you about is Shamani Makiba Gibson. She died two weeks after birth from a pulmonary embolus. She was 30 years old. Her partner, Omari Maynard, was an artist, is an artist. Her mother, Shawnee Benton Gibson, was very involved. And this, this woman was a partner, a mother, a daughter, a sister, an entrepreneur, and a performance artist. Shamani's partner, Omari, and her mother shared their story in a film called Aftershock. If any of you get a chance to see it, please see it. It's a bell that cannot be unrung once you see that, that film. You'll never you'll never look at maternal mortality the same again. Shamani's partner, Omari, and her mother, Shawnee, introduced this first at the Sundance Film Festival. And now Hulu has taken it on, so it's on Hulu. 
May I suggest you see this film as soon as possible and share it with other people on your website, on Facebook, everywhere. Okay. So Shamani um, delivered her baby and she went home. She complained from, she had a C-section. She complained from the time she got home that she was feeling very short of breath and exhausted. She called the hospital. She spoke to several people at the hospital. They told her, you just need to rest. It's normal. They kept pushing her off. She came in for her post-op visit. She told the provider then, I'm feeling short of breath. I'm tired all the time. Go home and rest. No problem. Okay? The family did what black families do when the doctor says, you're fine. <laughs> Go home and rest. They took care of everything. They took care of the baby. They made food for her and had her rest. Two weeks later, she died of a pulmonary embolus. Okay. It's a documentary, that movie? Mm hmm it's Yeah. Yep, it's a, okay. Okay. The next person is Amber Rose Isaac. She passed away on an operating table with HELP syndrome. Just a few minutes after giving birth to her son Elias, and she never even got to hold him. She's 26 years old. Her partner's name is Bruce McIntyre III. Amber attempted to advocate for herself also after she was unable to schedule an appointment in-person visit with her doctor at the start of COVID. Her last visit with her provider in person was in February. And she was six months pregnant at that point. All appointments at that point from February until April were all virtual on, online. During the time of COVID, visiting was curtailed. They wouldn't let visitors in. They wouldn't let anyone in the operating, in the um, delivery suite with the patient. Several hospitals, my hospital, thank God, didn't do that. But several hospitals had no visiting. The mother had to come in and deliver all by herself. So during that time, um, Amber kept calling the hospital trying to get an appointment to come in, and that did not happen. So Bruce and Amber decided to try to pursue a home birth, and they got in touch with a midwife. They scheduled an appointment with her, and she requested the medical records. They met with her, and she requested the medical records, and um, she reviewed those records. The midwife was greatly concerned when she noticed several discrepancies in her chart. One thing was that when she looked at the lab, she looked back to the, in December, there had been a lab report that she had, that Amber had low platelets. That was back in December. Her last visit at, in, in house was in February. So that was three months later, okay? Um, also, it showed that she had severe anemia at that time. Amber had been complaining about fatigue and exhaustion during the whole pregnancy. And she had talked to her provider about it and tried to get off from work because she was feeling so poorly. She was denied the documentation needed for that, and so she continued to work. The midwife let her know at that point, you're high risk. I can't take care of you. You're not a candidate for a home birth. She said, you have to seek, emergent, you have to seek care now. Get to a doctor now. You know, this is, this is serious. So she returned to the hospital, and on April 20th, an induction of labor was started, and she was diagnosed with HELP syndrome. She was taken to the OR. She was, an induction is when we start labor, but at some point there was, I guess, an emergency, and so they took her to the OR for an emergency C-section. Later, one of the staff members said to her, her family, her blood just wouldn't clot. It was like water. A hysterectomy was performed after the baby was born to try to stop the hemorrhaging to no avail. So she died also. Okay, then um, this was during COVID, so you know all of the politicians were involved. So at the time, um, Senator Kamala Harris stated that her death was, uh, it was shared on like national platform because COVID was kind of the culprit. They thought, you know, that she wasn't see, being seen in person. So uh, Senator Kamala Harris shared that her death was a national was on a national platform because basically the pandemic had highlighted the deep racial disparities that, it, that was apparent in our healthcare system. 
In New York, black women are eight times, like I said, more likely to die from a pregnancy-related cause and almost three times more likely to um, experience severe maternal morbidity. One cause is thought to be dismissed effects of racism and implicit bias and the care that is often not culturally congruent. The public advocate was Jermaine Williams at the time, and Vanessa L. Gibson is now one of the borough, pres uh, borough presidents, but she was then the co-chair of the New York Council of Women Caucus, and they all became advocates for women, maternal health for women in New York. Some of the suggestions that were put forth was that in New York there should be legislation um, that would be required twice a year, training people about implicit bias. They also should pay midwives and doulas to care for women because they felt that doulas um, are another advocate. That's another layer of advocacy for that patient. Okay. Her husband, Bruce, has now started a foundation called Save a Rose Foundation, which is a birth equity group and is advocating for a freestanding birth center in the Bronx. So that's what came out of this. These husbands are really out here advocating. They're in Washington. They're everywhere. They're on TV. They're making documentaries. Okay. The last person I want to tell you about is Kiera Johnson. Some of you may have heard about her. She's Judge Hatchett's um, daughter-in-law. So. Kira Johnson was 36 years old. She died after a scheduled repeat C-section. This is a normal, like, you're going to have your C-section on this day. This wasn't even an emergency, okay? Um, she spoke five languages. She was a college-educated woman. She was a pilot. She had a, a, a pilot license. She was healthy. She exercised. She, she did all the right things, okay? Her husband's name is Charles Johnson. Um, she had a baby about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. This was a scheduled C-section. There's a video of Judge Hatchett with the first child coming out of the PACU to tell her, we'll see you after the surgery. Okay? They, they, and they put this, you know, this is all televised. So she had the baby at 2 p.m., and she came to the PACU. They brought, the baby was with her at the time. There's videos of her with her baby. But she was complaining of pain, a lot of abdominal pain. After about two hours, her husband was sitting at her bedside, and he looked down, and he saw blood in the catheter. And he alerted the nurses, and they alerted the, the um, doctors. And they came immediately to, to um, evaluate her. They ordered lab work for her at that time and a CAT scan, a STAT CAT scan. Okay. Charles, during the interviews afterwards, states that he begged, he pleaded, and advocated for her constantly over the next 10 hours and he was dismissed and disrespected. A nurse later told Charles, your wife was not a priority. The CAT scan was never done. She was ordered, um, she died on an OR table. They finally took her back to the OR 10 hours after, the, after she had that problem, where they found over three liters of blood in her belly, and they found out that they had lacerated her bladder. That's, what the bleed, that's where the bleeding was coming from. Her greatest risk factor that was faced was thought to be racism. Her husband brought, has brought a, a civil lawsuit right now against the hospital. He's asking the hospital to take accountability for his wife's death and be transparent. The hospital made this, fight, this um, statement about the ongoing lawsuit. We are actively working to eradicate unconscious bias in healthcare and advance health equity in healthcare more broadly. We commend Mr. Johnson for the attention he has brought to the important issue of race disparities in maternal outcomes. We need to say their names. We need to hear their stories. They are our sisters, our daughters, our aunts, our mothers. Which group below is biased? Correct answer, they all are. I'm going to tell you some stories. These are composites, some of them. Some of these are straight stories. I'm not giving any names to them. We had two patients in a labor and delivery triage unit. One had private insurance, one had Medicaid. The one with private insurance is seen in the private practice. The one with Medicaid is seen in the clinic. But both women are scheduled to deliver at that hospital. 
There are residents there, interns and residents at that hospital. The nurse reported to the intern that one of the women should be seen first because of the severity of her symptoms. She was having a headache and epigastric pain. The attending arrived and told the intern, see the private patient first. So the nurse realized that the, the attending didn't hear the, the report that she had given to the intern, so she repeated it to the, um, to the, the doctor. He listens, and then he turns back to the intern and says, I said, see the private patient first. So that's what happened. What is happening so blatantly on hospital units right now that allow this type of bias to be perpetrated? This situation could have been deadly. This is how black women die when we're put off, okay? When you triage, you're, you're looking at who's in triage and you pick the people that need the care first. Okay, this woman could have had a paper cut, but she still was gonna get seen first, and that was bias, okay? Delayed attention to clinical warning signs lead to maternal complications and deaths. The nurse attempted to advocate for that patient to no avail. She was more concerned about the client's welfare than her coworkers' opinion of her. The result of this story, the, patient, the nurse quit that job the next day. Was that her only recourse, you think? What do you think? What, what type of environments do we work in? Don't we have a voice? In many places, we don't. That's why this is so important, what we're doing here this weekend. This should be a conversation across the country. I recognize that we have families to support, and it's hard to stay in places that are so racially biased, okay? But the problem is, if we leave the bedside, then who do the patients even have to try to advocate for them? So, for them. And that's what happens. People job hop because they're frustrated where they are, but then we're leaving the patients just out here to fend for themselves. Okay. Studies show that depending on the race of the client, respectful care and bias-free care differ. Okay. What organizational structures are in place that allow um, care different from one woman to the next, depending on her race? Um, like I said before, there's some, certain things are things that are written into policy. So we have to get more involved in reviewing policy and getting policies changed in our facilities. Some policies have been in the book so long that they don't need, people don't even know they're there until someone says, you have to do a drug screen. Why? Okay, we have to start questioning certain things and standing up. Okay. Okay. Um, I'll give you another example. Okay, we have two patients on two different sides of the street. Private hospital on one side, city hospital on the other. These residents work on both sides. So we have a mother that's there, and she's a gravid, let's say they're a gravid of eight. She's been pregnant eight times. She has seven children at home. On the, on the um, side with the private hospital, the woman is a Hasidic um, Jewish woman. That report at that board is that she's there. She's in labor, no big thing. Go across the street to the city hospital. That same medical history at board report, you'll hear. Did anyone talk to her about an IUD? Did you put it in right after delivery? Did you talk to her about that? Because she may not come back for her postpartum visit. Whole different, whole different conversation about the exact same medical history. Why? That's bias. I call it a bias alert. Okay, that's the stuff that has to stop. And what are we teaching these residents and these interns? Because they're hearing both sides. They're hearing it, and it's normal. That group think I told you about, where they just kind of stand there and listen, somebody has to speak up and say something. It's not okay. That's me, I'm the rebel. I'm the one that speaks up, okay? All right. Okay, another situation. We have, a, we have two women. They come to their appointments that day, their prenatal appointments. 
Um, first woman is asked to stay, both women are asked to stay for observation because they have elevated blood pressures. So we want to evaluate them for preeclampsia, which takes some lab work and some monitoring of the blood pressure and that sort of thing. The first woman says, um, I, need to, I need to leave to go take care of child care arrangements for my child because they want her to stay overnight. She said, let me go home and take care and make arrangements and I'll, I'll be back. So the provider tells this woman, okay, these are the signs. If you have any of these severe signs, come back immediately. Otherwise, we'll see you tonight. No problem. Okay. A call is made to labor and delivery. Hi, Ms. Jones will uh, be coming in tonight. Expect Ms. Jones this evening. She's coming in for evaluation of preeclampsia. Okay, bye. That's the first woman. Same scenario on the other hospital. Same dilemma. I need to make child care arrangements. I left my t children with my neighbor. I just came for a, a prenatal visit. I have to go home and take care of my, you know, get them settled. And I'll come back. Different, whole different board report. Oh, she might not come back as promised. She's signing out. She's declined to stay. They make her sign out AMA. Okay. Hmm. All right. Dr. Gina Stewart stated that when you are automatically underestimated, when your voice is often silenced, when you're automatically presumed to be incompetent or inferior, those are the kind of things that will either make you or break you. Many of our clients, for, for many of our clients, that causes them to opt out of care. They'll come maybe once, and if they're not treated properly, they won't come back, okay? And if they do come back, they're not really talking to us. They're being talked at instead of to, okay? A lot of things that women experience, they're not gonna tell you till they trust you. And we have a lot of providers that come in with almost like a checklist. Wait, okay, fine. Blood pressure, fine. And they go down the checklist. And they, the patient walks out the door. They haven't gotten any question answered. And that provider really knows nothing more about that patient other than her vital signs than when she walked in, her, in that door. Um, during pregnancy, that's one of the highest times of, of high risk um, of a woman being in a domestic violence situation. Many pregnant women are killed during pregnancy. That's like one of the highest incidents of domestic violence. Is a woman gonna tell you that she's in that situation if she doesn't trust you? No, okay. So what is your story? Okay, we'll talk about some other bias. Sometimes it's not bias against the patient. Sometimes it's bias amongst providers and pro different providers. This one is called hospital birth versus um, home birth, and the patient gets caught up in the middle of the bias, unfortunately. Many people who are home birth advocates are anti-hospital birth. Many people that are hospital staff members are anti-home birth. We should stop using the word always and never, and it never places people into boxes, okay? Not all of anything is good or bad. Unfortunately, mothers who transfer to the hospital from home births are transferred because there's a problem, and that's how it's supposed to work. It was felt that the hospital care was warranted, so the midwife said transfer them to the hospital. Unfortunately, mothers who transfer um, come to a hospital sometimes with people that are anti-home births. <laughs> so they kind of are treated a little differently when they get there because they're looked at as, oh, they have this birth plan, and they have all of these wonderful things they want to do. And sometimes hospital staff is not happy with that, because we have policies, okay? Um, all right. So it can be biased from the hospital staff against the home birth staff, that kind of thing. So a patient delivered, this is how they get in the middle and get caught up. A patient delivered a few minutes after being transferred from home to the hospital. Just a few minutes, she could have stayed in the elevator and then this wouldn't have happened, okay? She would have had the baby. The chatter began before the patient even got to the floor. We had gotten a report on the phone and basically it said that this patient um, did not wish her baby to get erythromycin eye drops and she didn't want the baby to get hepatitis B vaccine and she wanted to go home in 12 hours, okay? I don't see a problem with that, but a whole bunch of people did, <laughs> okay? 
The, the refusal immediately triggered that she was being non-compliant. She hadn't even gotten it yet, but she was non-compliant. And she was asked to sign a refusal of vaccination as soon as she got in the door. Okay, as soon as the baby is born, you have to sign this refusal of vaccination. And if you want to leave in 12 hours, you have to sign out AMA. Now, she had a provider that was going to be with her. Her midwife was still her midwife. She was going to go home and have those things done at home. That was her plan. The baby was still going to get the, the Hep B vaccination at home, and they were still going to get the eye care at home. Okay? But it was a big snafu. The patient left very upset. She had to sign out. Her whole birth plan just was blown. And it was the attitudes of, every, of the people there. And what I tell the staff is you cannot talk about what happened at home and the ones at home. I tell the midwives that are doing home births, don't talk negative about the hospital because at some point that patient may need to come in. And if you are talking negatively about hospital births and the people that work there, how comfortable is that patient now that you're telling her she has to go to the hospital? You know, we have to really be careful. Okay, so we have to know all of these um, stories, but you can only learn these stories if you ask your patients and if you do a respectful care with them and if you are there and you, you form a bond with them. But when you're biased and you don't see people as individuals, you're not going to ever form a good bond with them. I have patients I've seen five and six times, and maybe on the sixth time I just look at them and say, What's, you don't look happy today, what's going on? It takes time even when you try to form a bond with patients sometimes because these are things that are very personal and it takes time. They're, they're sitting back watching, seeing if you care, seeing if you really are looking at them as an individual. But you should get to know your patients to the point where you can look at them and say, something's off today, like what's going on with you? And they'll say, no, I'm fine. No, you're not fine. You don't look fine. Okay, that's the only time that we can really step in and help them Okay, we have a lot of services that are available, but if you don't know what's going on, how would you even know how to refer them? Yeah, I found out many of my patients, they, they miss appointments, okay? And in the chart, all you see is um, um, absent from care, did not come, call, no answer. I had a patient that came in, she missed probably three or four months of her prenatal care. When she came in, I said, are you okay? I said, you know, I know you haven't been here for a while. What's going on? Her husband had been killed, okay? She had children. She had to find a job. She had to move from where she lived. She was in another, another borough from where our hospital is. She was doing her best just to hold on by her fingernail. But if you don't ask her, then she's the one that comes in in labor, and somebody automatically said, she's, she's been absent from care. She only had one visit. Did you even ask her? Did anybody even know what was going on with her? No. Okay, patients that are homeless now go half a pregnancy sometimes and nobody even realizes that they're homeless. Okay? Domestic violence. They move, if you, if you get someone help or if they get help in domestic violence, they usually move them to another area away from where the, the um, perpetrator lives. So they're pushed out of their borough far away from the hospital. These are things that are actually happening. I have moms that can't get to us because they can't get transportation-wise. Where I, I work in the Bronx, and there are elevated train stations there with no elevator. If you have a toddler and you're pregnant, how do you get up the elevator steps? Because you know the toddler needs a stroller because they're not going to stay awake the whole time. You can't even get a stroller up the steps. And Lord forbid, now you have a toddler and a new baby. How do you do that? So we need to look at things in the community. Do we need to give people vouchers to get to the hospital? You know, a cab, a, a van, something to get them there because there's no way that you can get up those steps without having someone there to help you. You know, so we have to look at not just how we are as providers, we have to look at the community and what, what things are in the, in the community to help the patient. If you go in other areas, there's elevators in there for their trains. We don't have that. Okay. Okay, 
So the differences in women's lives and families vary. It's very important to connect with our clients and learn about their lives so that we can partner with them to develop a plan of care that they can live with. We can tell them our plan of care all day, but they have to be able to live with it. So they are the center of the care. Um, also, you might have a mother who's a frontline worker. She may be working on a job that has no sick time, no vacation time. If she takes a day off, she's going to get fired. Okay? Is anybody in here going to pay her rent? Put food on her table? But those are the kind of judgments that people make. They're just biased. You know, it's like she doesn't care. She's not coming for whatever reason. We place people into boxes. Gifts belong in boxes, not people. At my hospital, we deliver about 1,100 babies a year. If I'm hearing these type of stories, what kind of stories are y'all hearing? What is happening across the country? The good news are, is that we are caring professionals, and we leave home every day to, to do a good job. And I think people would do a good job if they would understand, you know, as far as bias, if they would understand what it is and that we all have it. We do this with bias. We point fingers at others. I was shocked to see how biased people are, and, and they don't even realize it. But I personally realized that I was. And so, you know, when you start to look at different situations now, hopefully you'll start to see things. And we have to give ourselves grace, because like you saw, you all saw triangles, didn't you? <laughs> okay. <laughs> this webinar for you um, begins a journey for many of you. For others, it's a confirmation that you're on the right path to recognizing and learning about bias. One of the goals of this whole thing is to create a safe space, okay, to let us know what it is, but give ourselves grace and give others grace. But we have to start to learn about it more. The fact that we're all here today just highlights our commitment to the women we serve and our determinants of health, okay? Um, the main thing today I want you to know is I'm talking about maternal health today, and I know all of you are not maternal health, but like I said, if you touch a woman at any point, it could be your daughter, it could be your niece, your, nep your niece, or a female in your family, or you're a provider and you, you interact with families, you still need to know this information. And bias training goes across all specialties. So the things that we learn here, we just take it with us. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm on. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, although today's presentation centered on this, it's been my most recent experience. The stories will be different, but I can tell you this, the need for training spans all specialties and can be applied to every person that you interact with, colleagues, those in the C-suite from top to the bottom, okay? Because in the C-suite, they're doing the hiring. That's a big area of bias. We have name bias. They can look at a name on an application and say, mm-mm. They won't even call you, okay? So bias is just universal, it's everywhere. So we have to look inside and we have to leap. Learn how to recognize bias. Expect to find bias when you look inside because we're all biased. We're gonna accept that there are ways to, be, to overcome it individually and we're gonna practice and prioritize the individual strategies, okay? So one thing you do is when you start to get a bias thought, just take a deep breath because if you just give yourself a second, your mind will re-regulate, okay? Pause as soon as you realize that you're having a negative thought formulating. Just don't say anything, for just a second, okay? Self-reflect and call a timeout. Recalculate and change the trajectory of that thought and then flip the script. This, I think, is the most easiest way to, to recognize it when you flip the script. If you say something to a patient or you hear someone else say something about a patient, say, how would I feel if that was my daughter, my sister, myself? That's usually right enough right there that you're like, no, that wasn't right. And it gives you a chance to recalculate and do it again. So stand up, speak up, call a timeout, and then flip the script. Okay, any questions at all? Any comments? I recommend my bias training. <laughs> 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 oh. Just repeat the question because we have an audience there. Oh, 
Oh, okay. Um, the question was, do I recommend one bias training over another? Like I said, I'm the CEO of Transitions Women's Health. I specialize in bias training. If you would scan that um, QR code, you can get in touch with me, connect with me, and we can talk. My website is www.transitionswomenshealth.net. Can I uh, have you all just to thank Dr. Williams once again for that awesome. <laughs>